Peace everyone, I'm Mascard here and welcome to a special live stream. Uh, a couple weeks ago, or maybe, yeah, I think it was a couple weeks ago, I asked you guys if you'd like me to do a critique of some of your artwork. So I posted over in the Unmask Family Facebook page. Uh, I have a link for that in the description, by the way, if you want to join. And uh, you guys shared some of your lovely work I have here in front of me, uh, one of them. I'll be going through these in no particular order. Um, literally, it's just the way they opened up in Photoshop for me, so no order whatsoever. And I'm just going to go ahead and go through them, give you some of my feedback, some of my tips on how you might be able to improve it, things to think about in future projects. Um, pretty much just as much helpful information as I can give you. Uh, in no way am I uh, judging your work um, to say whether or not you are a good or bad artist. I would never do anything like that. I don't think uh, I don't think such things are uh, beneficial to anybody. So um, I think all of you turned in really great work, and uh, I look forward to going through it with you. So hopefully you enjoy the stream. Hopefully you learn something, and let's just uh, let's just jump into it. Um, hello, Barbara, Anush, uh, Georgina, Estralita, uh, Vor, Align, Peter, uh, Sergio. Good to see everyone. Okay, so the first project here, oops, first project here I have from Heidi. Uh, this is a white charcoal on black paper. Uh, she mentioned that she's experimenting with simplicity, and I think. Um, that's a fun experiment to try. I mean, with just a few a few lines here, you're able to really like harness everything that just puts into motion this this horse that is running. And I think that you did a really good job on it. Um, I, as far as improvements, there's there's not a whole lot that I think you can improve on because for one, it is it is simplicity that you're kind of uh, going for here, but. There are probably two things that I can really mention. The first thing, um, the horse anatomy. Now, I'm, I'm not a horse uh, expert in any way whatsoever, but what stands out to me just a little bit is the nose here. I think maybe if we just zoom in just a tad, I think maybe this is just a little high here. Could be wrong, but that part of the, the face just looks a little bumped up to me, and so there, there's the change that I made. So just, just a tiny, teeny, tiny little thing that I did. Um, another thing, um, the horse's lip. I think the, the horse's lip might be jutted out just a tad. Horses, you know, they tend to have their lips out just a, just a bit more. So here's, here's just the small, teeny, tiny, subtle changes that I did. Uh, I realized that simplicity is the key here, but simplicity doesn't mean that you shouldn't be accurate. So. Um, maybe just check your reference or whatnot with that. Um, and then other, other than that, I thought what would be a really good, um, a really good addition to this is maybe just a tiny detail in the eye. And I'm talking teeny tiny detail, just, just a speck of a highlight in the eye there to bring out the face just a tiny bit more. Maybe that isn't the exact placement for the eye, but it just adds like a little sparkle to the eye that I think adds just a bit more detail to um, to the project. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention, so aside from that, there was really nothing um, anatomy-wise that I think that you could maybe develop a little bit more on. The other thing is cleansliness. So I realize you're working with charcoal here, and that's kind of the, the opposite of charcoal. But I see here this, this line that is the curvature of the horse's back. I think that if you were to just maybe have this cleaned up just a bit, hold on one second, um, and make this, make this edge really nice and clean and sharp, I think that would really help define the horse's body just a bit nicer. So very, just touch it up a little bit. Same thing with the front where the chest is, just kind of cleaning up the edges, making them as crisp as possible. I think that's really going to um, add a, a lot of like subtle perfection to the work. Um, so here's, here's just a tiny, just a hint of cleaning up, and it kind of smooths out the horse and just makes it look even more in motion. The other thing that I think you can do, like 
uh, like the mane here coming off, uh, you have really great motion, and I like the way that the lines are kind of blurred out and they just kind of fade away. It really adds a lot of great motion to the horse. But what I'd like to see is maybe a few small details. Let's just get a small brush here. Uh -oh. Like a few extra hairs kind of coming off like this reinforcing the motion. Now I'm doing this with a mouse, so please forgive the uh, sloppiness of the lines, but if you extend them out and kind of just have a little touch of extra detail in the hairs there, I really think it's going to add a whole nother dimension to the horse and also, you know, let the change of direction, um, you know, all the hairs aren't going to be moving in the same, same exact path. So having a little bit of variety there with the hair, I think is just going to add just a bit, a bit extra. This is the icing on top. So here's the changes, very subtle. Um, aside from that, it looks really great and I think you did a fantastic job. Anyways, I have a lot to get through, so let me uh, hurry on up through here. Uh, and here is the next one, and this one here, let me find it really quick, who did this one? I know she was, she, she mentioned she was a little disappointed, uh, where is it at? Where is it at? I know it's here. Okay, so this was Tina. Yes, Tina. So um, you mentioned that you weren't super happy with this watercolor project, um, and you only used three colors. Well, for the life of me, I cannot tell you, I, I, I cannot um, understand why you would be unhappy with this. I think as an illustrative piece, this is spot on just uh, fantastic. I love the color choice. Going with just three colors really helps like narrow down. It doesn't it doesn't muddy things up and that happens a lot. You know, uh, too often uh, people are just grabbing like 15, 16, 17 different colors and they're just like going in there and trying to to make something and it just ends up looking like mud. Here you chose really, really wisely with your colors. Uh, I think that you utilized the, the, the color range that you're able to get with, with watercolors by adding more water and getting more translucent colors and getting faded colors. Uh, I really like the bleed that you got from the paper. I'm not sure which paper you used, but the, the watercolor bleed that you have in the flowers is, is really, really nice. It's very soft, and um, the complements of the green and the, and the pink, red, uh, work really nice in the, in the piece. Um, as far as improvement goes, uh, there's very minimal. I would say the only improving factor that I would suggest given that you did share the reference photo. Um, the flowers do have a hint more orange. Um, the, you, have this, you have this flower in the back here. You have this flower in the back right here that has what feels like a little bit more orange in the yellow tone. Um, and that could possibly just be some of the colors kind of bleeding together, a little bit of green maybe. Um, but I like that orange tone that you got in this flower in the back, and I'd love to see that kind of in the center of the roses here, just a, a little, a little extra orange, and I think, I, I think it's perfect. I, I for the life of me, I can't figure out why you would be disappointed with this. I think it looks fantastic. Um, so, no changes to that. Um, although I could, I could add a little bit of orange. Let me, let me go ahead and show you what I mean with that orange. So let me just grab this this yellow that you use here. Um, boost up the saturation and change it more to an orange. Now I'm going to do this extreme, so just bear with me here. That's not saturated enough. Let's go even more saturated. So I'm going to just add a sprinkle of orange in here and then I'm going to adjust the layers to show you what I mean with a, with a bit of orange in the center. So let's just go to... Uh, Soft light, uh, no, let's go with multiply, yeah. And then I'll just change the, or actually I'll change the tone of the orange just to see where I want to take it. Yeah, so maybe like that, a little bit more orange and then just tone it down just a little bit. There we go. So 
here's um, here's the original, and here's with just a little bit more orange in the flowers. I think I think the center part just needs to be a, a little bit more value, a little bit more saturation saturation in there, and a touch of orange, and I think they look just fantastic. Um, right now, the I think maybe the reason you feel a little unhappy or a little dissatisfied is the center of the oranges, or, or I keep calling them oranges, the center of the roses. Uh, they they just resemble the outer edges too much, and so they look a little two-dimensional. So if you add just a little bit more saturation and value to the center parts, making them just subtly darker, um, it kind of just makes them more three-dimensional. Anyways, uh, fantastic job, and let's move on. Uh, real quick, let me say hello to anybody I might have missed in the chat. Oh, hello, Lisa. Um, Alda, Doomsday Dragon Productions. Uh, oh, how do you submit something? So, um, yeah, the submission was on Facebook, uh, on the Unmasked Family Facebook page. Oh, hello, Chandri. Good to see you. And I love Oregon. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you. All right, moving on. All right, if I can, if I can even bring myself to. Uh, critique this in any way. So if, if you guys don't know uh, Anna, she's, uh, she's a fellow YouTuber. Uh, she hasn't posted many videos um, too, too recently or anything, um, but she's been, she's really gotten into digital painting, I would say probably in the last year, year and a half, and she just turns out like amazing work like this. So you can see, uh, here's her art tag, Fine Art Anna. Uh, you can find her on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, and I highly recommend you go check out her other work. Um, the fact that she submitted this for a critique is rather comical because she should be probably giving me lessons, but uh, yeah. Anyways, another thing about this painting here, this is a digital painting first off, I just want to mention that. Um, over on Patreon, uh, I will be doing a pastel tutorial of this exact uh, painting right here. So if you want to learn how to do something like this in pastels, this is going to be the next pastel project and that will start not tomorrow but the following Tuesday. So a week from today, Tuesday, uh, we will be starting this project in pastels over on Patreon. Um, I have a link for my Patreon in the video description also. Anyways, let's talk about this painting here a little bit. The first thing that I want to mention is the colors. If you're familiar at all with Anna's uh, color palette, she loves these pastel like greens and pinks and purples. Like right here in all of this uh, cloudy kind of foggy look, that is her like iconic uh, color palette and she uses those colors in a lot of her work and she does does an amazing job with those colors um, something something I'm I've always been a little jealous of her work is she's her work is so identifiable simply because of her color palette um, but uh, I really like the offset of these warm pastel colors with the cool foreground that is going that is that creates a really really nice dynamic between the background and the foreground you have you have a lot of different contrast types the the first contrast that most people are familiar with is light and dark so you have you have this light well lit background and then you have this darker foreground and that creates a really nice dynamic of contrast separating the foreground from the background you also have textural contrast so again, in the background, you have this really soft, everything's very soft and semi-blurry in the background, and then in the foreground, you have all of this texture. You have the grass, you have the leaves, you have the, the bark on the tree, the fur on the, on the deer, um, and all of that. And that textural contrast also helps reinforce that separation, giving distance between the background and the foreground. The third type of contrast that you have is, of course, color contrast. So uh, you can kind of think of the extreme of color contrast being complementary colors. So in this case, complementary colors are mixed in uh, a little bit. You have some of the oranges 
uh, and yellows of the fire here that complement the blues of the the rest of the the foreground and it it creates this sensation of light and brightness um, so that's a nice play on on complementary colors um, but uh, you have that you have that degree of contrast in, in color happening as well with with uh, just color so um, the difference between light and dark is obviously white and black that's the most extreme contrast that you have when it comes to value the most extreme um, case of contrast when it comes to just pure color is of course the complement so the complement of purple is yellow so you can use those uh, to create contrast anyways um, there's there's so much to say about this this painting it's the the depth is really really well done i think i think as far as um critiquing it the the best i could do is for the background i i would have liked to see the background uh where this the kind of the smoke of fog kind of thing is coming i would love to see that just a tiny bit softer just a little bit blurrier um it's it's the cloud edges just seem to be a bit more in focus than what i would um what i would want down here it's nice and soft but like around here it's just a little bit harder than i'd like um because i want that background to i don't want the texture of the background competing with the foreground i don't want anything competing in this uh this scene because it's already very complex and so I think softening the background just a little bit more blurring it uh, would have would have helped create more distance um, the other thing uh, and I'm being very very nitpicky here because you submitted this and <laughs> it's it's your fault <laughs> the the other thing is down here um, the water um, the water is 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 really nice you can tell that it's water at least I'm I'm pretty sure that's water, but it looks like you, you know, sped through this or you laid it out and then you forgot to go back and touch it up. It just feels a little a little kind of loose and, and sketchy um, in comparison to the level of uh, precision and detail that you've brought to like the grass and like right up here, like you have really nice detailed sprinkled in, breaking up the rocks and, and adding a little grass, but it looks like you kind of, I don't know, you forgot to go back to the water after sketching in and kind of building out the colors a little bit. You have nice ripples and things happening in there, but a few of them a few of them look unnatural, like the, these circles here. Um, again, I'm just being super nitpicky. This is your fault for submitting it. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is that the tree. Um, the tree bark also great colors, but the, the level of texture that I feel you you got in a tree just doesn't match up to the grass and the deer even though they feel like they're on the same focal plane and um, yeah I would have liked to see just a bit more texture in the tree bark uh, since they they do feel like they're on the same focal plane um, other than that I mean I love that the touch of fire over here uh, glowing these these trees and the use of the the use of complementary colors it, it just came together really really nicely but uh, other than that like yeah fantastic work I'm gonna move on because I could talk about this painting all day um, anyway so the next one here let me see who submitted this one all right this was uh, Sharon and this is from a live session so this is a live drawing session using Carbothello pastel pencils now anytime you do a live session um, there is a degree of complexity. You know, the model doesn't hold perfectly still. You only have a limited number of, uh, li a limited amount of time, uh, and you kind of, you know, want to, to speed up. And then also drawing from life is, is one of the more difficult, uh, difficult parts of, of art in general, just, you know, because lighting is never constant. Things are changing, especially you, your, your addition of color here, you know, it's, it's hard to do things like that. Um, now, I have to I have to put my mindset in the in the midst of of doing a live session and you have to ask yourself in this case you're working on a portrait any live session could be any number of subjects it could be still life it could be 
you know, um, I don't I don't know if they do live sessions of animals, but I suppose that is a possibility. Maybe somebody could bring in a dog, um, a really really well trained dog that you know can maybe sit still for like thirty seconds. Um, but uh, human subjects are probably among the most popular. Um, so when you're when you're working with anything portrait based, you always have to you always have to remind yourself what is the most important thing about portraits, and that is the where the viewer's eye. When you're creating work, you want to your your obligation as an artist is to control the viewer's eye. You have to understand that that people have short attention spans, and if you don't pull their attention into something specific. They're probably just going to glance over your work and then move on with their lives. Um, I mean, most people do that regardless of how good of an artist you are anyway, but um, just keeping that in mind, you'll want to, um, you'll, you'll want to be aware and self-aware of where you want the viewer's eye to go. And anytime you're doing a portrait, 99.9% .9 of the time, very few percent would ever not draw your attention directly to the eyes. That's where, that's where you want your viewer to go when looking at a portrait. Now, in the case of this one, uh, I can see your taped edge here, and I, can, I think this is the edge here. So I can kind of get an idea of how you composed this. And what it appears, what appears to me is that, um, so this is kind of the center here. Let me just grab a bright color. So it looks like this is about the center line of your paper. Why did not show up? Oh, wrong opacity. There we go. Um, so here's the center line of your paper and then probably about here. Something something like that. Maybe, maybe not that angle. Maybe closer to this. Uh, I could be wrong. I'm just gauging it based off of the little bit of the border that I can see. And uh, what you'll notice here is that the eye is right here. And so it doesn't, it's not falling in the center and it's not falling in any of the thirds. Let me change the color here. So the rule of thirds, a very, very helpful rule of thirds is very helpful when doing portraits uh, and landscapes, but we're looking at a portrait right now. So let's just, the green lines are the rule of thirds. And anytime you're doing a portrait, you need to take into consideration the dominant eye. Now in this case, only his one eye is showing. So composing this image with the eye crossing here, here, not so much here, not, not so much of the down lower thirds, the lower, low, the, the lower uh, thirds aren't usually common. Uh, since you have a nose and a mouth, you, de you, you generally want space for that. Um, you're not really focused on the top of the head, although his head seems rather large, you might want to focus on it. Uh, and then of course the center. So these are kind of, let me just outline those in blue. So these, these cross sections here are generally where you want to consider placing the dominant eye. And since he only has one eye, since it's a profile view, uh, you want to consider um, these three areas of your composition for placement of the eye. That's just going to give you a, generally a, a better shot at making a good composition. Now aside from that, uh, again, I want to bring attention to the, the eye since he only has one. I'm just gonna to refer to it as the eye. Um, so where you want your primary darkest contrast or your um, you know, your deepest contrast. Let me just grab the, one of the colors that you used here. I'm just going to darken it a little bit. So in the, here in the eye, you just want to bring more attention to it. So this means, you know, giving him a little bit darker eyelashes. You don't have to go like black or give him eyeliner or anything extreme like that. I'm using just a darker tone of the colors that you have here. Um, you definitely want to go, you know, nice and dark with the pupil. Make his pupil stand out. Maybe something like that. Grab a light color for sprinkle of a highlight. Um, looks like he has kind of a grayish blue eye, so let's just grab a blue. 
desaturate it a little bit. Yeah, it's about maybe maybe not that extreme of a blue. So something closer to this. Yeah, maybe something like this. You can you can always tone these differently depending on how you do it. So I'm just going to focus on the eye on this this particular project. And I'm just doing a, a very crude job. I don't want to spend all day um, on just the eye here. Just want to give you an idea of what I mean. So all I did was bring in just a little bit of extra contrast and a little bit of extra saturation to just the eye. I didn't do anything else. And so this is the difference. So here, everything is rather two-dimensional, kind of flat, and there's no particular area that you're looking at that is pulling the viewer's eye in any particular direction. By adding just a little bit of extra saturation, more so than what the rest of the, the, the picture has, and a little bit of extra contrast, it pulls you right into that eye. So now he has like a nice vibrant blue eye, and his pupil is nice and, and dark, and it has a, a, a speck of a highlight that really just pulls you right into that, and right into the portrait. Now the other thing that I noticed uh, about this project here is since since you were lacking a little bit in that that value range um, with with the eye, what I found my eyes doing is coming down to his beard and looking at his beard. And the reason that your eye starts to fall down and kind of focus on what you probably didn't want people to focus on the beard. Uh, is because of the textural contrast that you've created. So with the with his his head, his cheek, his low contrast eye, um, everything's very flat. Everything's very smooth, and the only texture that you have, aside from the texture showing through from the paper, is that you have all of these textural lines in the beard. And you can I can zoom in a little bit here, and you can see all these little all these little lines here. Just grab a green so you can see these little individual hairs for the beard and that's creating a textural contrast against the otherwise smooth image and you want to be careful with that because if you are not if you're not adding the texture or you're not adding the detail and contrast to what people should be focusing on which is the eyes um, they're going to start focusing wherever you spent the most time and it appears uh, that you spent the most time adding the textural detail to the beard. Uh, I even see some of the hairs coming off the head here. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see these individual hairs, which is really great detail. It's really great detail, but I think you've lost the focal point of the portrait, and that's going to be the eyes. You could, you could even argue that it's the eye plus the glasses, because um, if his glasses were indeed this teeny tiny, then that creates a level of interest beyond, you know, the drawing itself. Teeny tiny little glasses on a head this big. Um, no offense to the gentleman that modeled for this, but um, as you've as you've depicted him, his he seems to be rather intelligent to say the least. Um, but his his glasses are like extra small. And so you can use that interesting bit of, of detail to, to enhance this even more. So if I take just a, a bit of the color that you used for the glasses, let me just uh, add some straighter lines here. That's the wrong opacity. So let's just go let's add something like that. So just Enhancing his glasses, let me grab the elliptical tool. There we go. Let's put these on a new layer so I can duplicate it. And eight pixels, is that gonna be too big? Yes it is. Let's try that again. Let's do four. go. 
deselect and duplicate T. Let's just bring it over there. I'm trying to do this quick. There we go. Um, you have a couple highlights here that I think work really great in the glasses. So let's just add to that. Maybe um, right on the edge. Right by the eye, perhaps, in a little bit right there. There, so there's the, the subtle change. So now I've started to bring a little bit more contrast into the glasses because they are a very interesting object in the portrait. And so here's the before, and here's just a few subtle changes I think would have improved it. So a little bit more contrast in the eye, some saturation, and a little bit of precision on the glasses, maybe just making them a bit darker um, since they are right around the eyes. There's something to focus on. Um, and then maybe you could just blend out the beard a little bit to soften that texture that you added to it. Um, all right, let's move on to the next one. Good job, by the way. All right, this is another portrait, and this one, this one is by, any second now, oh, where is it? All right, this one is by Barbara. Uh, pan, uh, this is pastel matte, pan pastels, Carbothello pastel pencils. So pan pastels and pastel pencils on pastel matte. Um, really, really fun uh, portrait, great subject. I have the reference photo here in front of me. And there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of neutral colors in the portrait. Um, you went a bit red on the shirt in comparison to the more, I would say it's like a, a faded purple red. It has, it, yeah, it's more of like a, a faded purplish red. Um, so you went a little bit red here, uh, but let's talk about the, the portrait um, and not so much the, uh, the shirt. Um, the first thing that I wanna uh, mention is that when you, whenever you're doing a portrait, and I try to emphasize this anytime I teach how to do a portrait, um, the, there's, there's kind of three key aspects in order to make a portrait recognizable. The very first and most important is always, always, always the eyes. If you don't, if you don't spend enough time on the eyes, uh, the portrait won't be recognizable because that's where everybody is looking when they see somebody. They're always looking at the person's eyes. You can often recognize people simply by looking at their eyes if you just remove everything else and you only have the eyes. Most of the time you'll recognize your best friend, you'll recognize your siblings, you'll recognize your parents. You, you have their eyes memorized. It's just something, it's, it's just we're always looking at it. We know exactly what they look like. And so when you're doing the eyes, it is, it is paramount that you uh, pay very, very close attention to exactly how the eyes are in the reference photo. So make sure when you're doing, when you're doing a portrait, uh, you, you hone in on the precision of the eyes. Um, that's something that you, you kind of got a little loose with here in the eyes. Um, I don't have the reference photo pulled up, but um, one thing that I can point out, I don't even, I don't even need the reference photo to point it out, but let's just, let's just come in here a little bit closer to the eyes. A, f a few of you may be able to do, to tell me in chat what, uh, what are some of the things that are just off a little bit. And the, the hardest thing about portraits is that off a little bit means not the same. It, it, it only takes like one, like the thickness of your pencil to change something drastically. And the first thing is the eye irises are different sizes, which you're not going to come across um, in reality 
at least not very often, not that I'm aware of. So let's just, um, I'm just going to copy, oops, this is the wrong layer. I'm just going to copy this iris. And I'm just gonna bring it right over here. So now that they're sitting like right next to each other, you can see that the one on the right, this one, is quite a bit bigger, but it's only bigger by about the thickness of your pencil. So I'm just gonna replace that iris, just like that. Um, and I'll just kind of clean up the top edge just a, just a tiny bit. So there's there's one small improvement. So here's his his right eye is it's kind of wandering just a tad, just that way. Well, I guess I'm looking at it this way, so it's kind of wandering that way for me. But this kind of fixes that. So his eyes uh, a little less wandery. Nothing wrong with the slightly bigger eyes. Kind of makes it a bit more cartoonish, less realistic, but I think it still looks good. Um, so be very, very careful with the uh, the irises. You want to make sure that they um, they match, and you also want to make sure that they're looking at the right at the right spot at, at one particular spot, unless you know they happen to have one of those eyes that don't don't listen to the rest of their body. Um, and then the other thing uh, is what we covered in the previous portrait, contrast. Um, you have some nice colors here in, you have some really nice colors going on everywhere, but you don't quite get, you don't quite get that contrast where you need it to be around the eyes. Don't be afraid to add the eyelashes down at the bottom I'm just going to add some dots here to give you an idea of what the contrast, a um, little bit of extra contrast will do. You don't have to give him makeup, you don't have to give him eyeliner. Um, the other thing is the, the creases around his eyes. So you have, you have um, a case of what things, what things seem to, to look like as opposed to what they actually look like. So if you look at the creases of his eyes, um, his, the top of his eyebrow I'm not eyebrow, but his eyelid, his crease goes like this. So it's not, it's not uniform the way you have it drawn. You have it kind of like you have the eye like this, and then you have the crease kind of just uniform over the eye like that. And that's not the way his creases are because since he's, he's older, his, um, the skin from here starts to come down off of the eye like this. So it creates those kind of, um, sadder looking eyes, not to say that he's sad, he doesn't seem very sad, um, but you get this shape. So that's the shape of his his crease and his eyelid uh, in the reference photo. So you, you wanna make sure you get that right, otherwise you're going to be changing his face and make it less recognizable, and that's not, that's not what you want. Now, um, the other thing, other thing here uh, is probably one of the most common things when it comes to portraits and not just portraits anything that involves skin uh, we have as artists when especially when you're new to art you generally have a fear of color and a color fear is something that is just rampant in the art community and nothing like a portrait shows that more. Um, the tones in his skin and the values that occur in his skin are much darker than what you have represented here. Uh, the darkest value you have like here in the, in the nostril, let's just isolate that color here off to the side. So this is the darkest color, but on the feathers behind him, this is your darkest color. So not quite black, but pretty close to black. But I can assure you that that, that space, you know, where you see into his nostril, that's going to be black. It's going to be dark. It's, it, I, it might not be pure black all the time, but it's going to be really close most of the time. And so yours, um, you have this kind of faded brown there which doesn't look too bad in comparison to the values you have surrounding it. Obviously, if you take black and you only put black in the nostrils here, uh, then the nostrils kind of 
they unnaturally feel um, they, they kind of unnaturally feel displayed or like wide open they kind of look like holes in the face um, uh, it doesn't look too bad with a, a darker black kind of it, it, it definitely makes his nose look more three-dimensional so you want to consider that um, but with the skin tone in general a skin incredibly incredibly complex there's so many colors that are happening in the skin and since I don't have the reference photo I'm not going to compare your colors directly to the skin but what I do notice is that uh, it seems like some gray maybe coming in uh, into the skin like in this area um, a little bit here past the eyebrow uh, I can see some kind of gray streaks a little bit in the cheeks right here uh, the underneath his lip this looks a little gray and then this looks like a line here I'm not sure what that line is uh, looks like he he has like a wrinkle right there um, and that's what you were trying to represent the, the the creases here the smile creases there's a bit of gray in there you want to be very careful incorporating black tones or gray tones into your skin now um, skin is actually a lot gray skin is very very gray um, and so it's important to have that balance of saturation in the skin, but you almost never want to use a dark gray, a black, or anything close to that family of color uh, in skin tones because it is so, it, it just sucks the life out of the skin. You want to focus much more heavily on um, like just neutral tones. So. Uh, if you were to take a gray and add red to it, you would have kind of like a dark brown red. Um, that would be a good color. Or something like uh, even even orange, like a, a gray plus orange, you're going to get kind of a like a muddy clay color. That's gonna that's gonna be a good a neutral color. So the, that's the color tones that you kind of want to to look for for your base colors of, of, of skin tones and his skin uh, you have a very peach like very very peach color and this is this is a good color that's a good color for skin tone um, then you have this color happening here um, and those are very good neutral base skin tone colors but you're lacking the life of the skin now, one of the um, uh, what you want to do here, you, so you have a very red-toned skin right now. What you want to do is you want to start bringing in yellow, because that is not yellow. You want to start bringing in yellow to warm the skin up. Usually, what ends up happening is uh, when people work on skin tones, is they either go too red or they go too yellow. And you need to you need to work in that balance. So I'm going to try to do that digitally, very delicately here. Uh, let's go real low opacity, and I'm just going to bring in a, a little bit of yellow into his skin. I'm going to probably tone this down after I add it, but just I'm, I just want to show you what a little bit of yellow does to the general skin tone overall. So I'm going to add a little bit of yellow to his skin, kind of just in various areas. Um, and then I'm going to take this this purple color. You have this nice purple color here, but I'm going to darken it. I'm going to go. I'm going to go darker. So I'm going to add a little bit of this, like under his eyebrows, where things um, where things should be darker, because the drop shadow from the light source underneath the eyebrows, definitely underneath the nose. Underneath the nose is generally really shaded. Just wanted to check. I was making sure I was adding this on the right layer. Uh, underneath his lip, just a little bit there, and then of course underneath his neck where the drop shadow continues. Now the, I, I kind of boosted the yellow a little bit too much. I'm going to tone that down in a second. But it's all about balance. It's all about balance here. Finding, finding your skin tones and working in the yellows, working in the oranges, working in the reds, and balancing them all out to get the, the right color that you want. So I'm just kind of loosely painting a little bit of, of yellow into his skin. 
and it just adds a nice warmth glow to his skin. So here's the project before, kind of flat. We talked about the precision in the eyes. You really want to, you really, really want to uh, to get that right. Um, then the contrast in the eyes, bringing out what matters in the face, like the nose as well. And then also just rebalancing a little bit of your tones. So right there, you know, a touch of yellow really makes the skin just a, feel a little bit warmer. Uh, like it get, like I said, I might have added just a, a a tad bit too much yellow, but I'm trying to do this a little bit quicker since I have like a million photos that I still have to do. <laughs> Anyways, I'm going to move on uh, from this, but hopefully that gave you some insight. Anyways, let's, let's go to the next one. Whew, I should have got water. I'm out of water. <laughs> um, uh, anyways, if you guys have any questions, I will try not to miss any of your questions. Uh, thank you, Joy. Appreciate that. Um, but uh, yes, let's move on to this project here. Where is this one? Who did this one? I always end up scrolling the wrong direction when I'm trying to find who did this. One. Oh, you're very welcome, Anna. I look forward to painting that, by the way, in pastels. I look forward to it. All right, so this one was from Bobby Brooks, um, acrylic on canvas, and um, where to improve. Now, this is also one of the, the, the pieces that I came across, and I was like, where to improve? Um, you should be teaching me. Uh, this, is, this is a really great, really great uh, subject, really great execution. Uh, fantastic level of detail and contrast. So I'm not going to cover like anything too too picky. Uh, just some just some subtle things that I think you can think about. You don't have to go this way. You didn't do anything wrong. Um, just some things to maybe think about for future projects and things to keep in mind. So as I described earlier, there's three types of contrast. You have value. You have texture. You have color. And in this, this image here, you have, you know, just monochromatic. So you're, you're, you only have two options. You have value, you have contrast in value, that's lights to darks, and you have value, or you have contrast in texture. And so that's, that's blurry versus texture. And in the case of this image here, you have a little bit of competition between the subjects. They have the uh, American flag in the background and the deer in the foreground. And you have to ask yourself, where is the viewer looking? Well, I can tell you the viewer is looking at the deer. The deer is the face, the deer has the eyes, the deer has the deeper contrast. And um, let me just zoom in a little bit. Um, so that's where most of your, your viewers are going to be looking. The, the, the flag is a backdrop. Right, it's just the background. Um, it has, you know, it has meaning obviously in this particular case, but it is still the background. It's not the focal point. It's just, it's it's more of a statement and not the story. Right? It's it's a sentence within the the book of this story of this image, and the uh, the story of the image is the deer. Like that's where people are spending their time looking at and uh, you you captured the deer great you have good contrast levels in the deer everything about it but the background it, it, it has a little competition just a subtle competition with the deer so I'm going to show you what I think would help this uh, project just a bit so let me go to the blur and what I think you could do is you could tone down the texture in the background and still tell a really, really effective story. And the way that I would approach this is I would have essentially painted the flag without the deer entirely, and I would have taped off the deer because you know how I love tape. Let's just go here. Yeah, let's go there. Um, I'm going to uh, soften this background just a little bit. So let's go here. I'm just gonna brighten the background, just a, just a hint, okay? Yeah, just a hint. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower the contrast in the background. I'm, I'm 
raising the blacks and lowering the whites is essentially what I'm doing with the background. And then take a mask here. And now I want the original deer. I, I like everything about the original deer, but what I want is I want the background to be blurrier. I don't want the competition to be so stark with the flag and the deer. So now I'm gonna just bring out the texture in one of the subjects. So I, I lowered the texture and the value contrast of the background. And now I'm just gonna pull out the texture and contrast of the deer and only the deer. And then we'll see what the difference is. So I'm going to do this relatively crudely, so ignore the, uh, the imprecise work of my brush. Like I said, I'm just using my mouse here to, to demonstrate, but here we go. So here is the new and improved in my eyes. Um, so the background is just, it's still there. Everything you see about the background is still there. The statement is still made, but the textural contrast is heightened. Now the deer really, the, the deer just kind of like jumps off the, the canvas in this case, right? So here's the original. The original, the, the flag has a lot of texture in it. You can kind of see the brush strokes, which, you know, might add well or look well in person. It's, it's hard to tell from a photograph. But uh, here, I just kind of, I kind of let the flag just kind of fade a little bit into the background. I didn't use as stark of contrast, um, and now you can see that the deer, I mean the deer really just punches through the image, right? I did not change a single thing about the deer. All I did was lower the textural and value contrast of the background, and um, that's something that you might consider for future projects. <clears throat> All right, uh, moving on. Fantastic job, by the way, Bobby. Really, really great. All right, so the next one. Uh, this one's tough to critique because uh, one, I don't have a reference photo, and two, uh, the photograph is colored. So uh, it looks like there's a shadow being cast across the paper here. So a little tricky to do a, um, a critique on, but I can still give you some general input. Uh, the first thing, uh, great subject, by the way, really fun. Um, the the first thing that I would mention is uh, your color choices. I imagine, I, in fact, I don't doubt that you used a reference photo for this image. Um, and you have, you have like this bright yellow, it's bright red and this bright blue, and then you have the neutral tones of the horse's fur. The, the horse looks really great as far as the color choices. The colors are very natural looking, everything looks good with the horse um, as far as the colors go but you have to ask yourself as an artist did these colors that this lady here is wearing do, does it fit what you're you're doing for this project does the yellow and the red and the blue really make all that much sense to be honest with you she kind of looks like um like she has uh, like a, a mcdonald's or burger king outfit because you know, with the uh, fast food restaurants, you have bright yellows and bright reds, and then some blues in there. If you, I think Wendy's has blues or something like that. But it's very like fast food restaurant colors. It's very bright, and it doesn't quite doesn't quite match the color tone of the you know the natural color tone of the horse, where you have these more natural earth tone colors. So I think when you're, when you're using a reference photo, definitely take a look at the colors showing through the image. And are those colors working well together? In a lot of reference photos, colors don't generally always make sense. Sometimes, sometimes you have this you know bright pink, bright red, bright blue, whatever color in a scene where it doesn't quite work as well. So what I'm gonna try to do with this image I am going to try to color balance 
no, not color balance. What do I want? Hue saturation, that's what I want. So let's undo that. I want, yes, hue saturation. I am going to go to the yellows here. First, I'm going to identify the yellows. Oh, this is that layer. That is the wrong layer. Go here. There we go. Um, so yellows. Wait, why are you doing this to me? Let me just let me just start over with this layer because it put it on the wrong layer. Stop. Photoshop, would you please stop? Photoshop is uh, not playing along right now for some reason. Oh my goodness, Photoshop, would you please knock it off? Can I not delete this layer or something? Why is Photoshop not working? Okay, finally. All right. <clears throat> Sorry about that. All right, hue saturation on this layer. Thank you very much. Uh, let's pick out the yellows. And I'm going to try to isolate the jacket only, just the yellow jacket. So I'm going to do this. Um, and then what I'll do is I have that selected, is I'm just going to isolate just the yellow jacket. Uh, not her hair. Her hair's fine. Not the horse. The horse is also fine. And then I'm going to go back to this and go back to my yellows. Thank you very much, Photoshop. I'm going to tone down the yellow and pull out the saturation. Pull out a lot of the saturation. Let's see, which maybe, maybe just add it a hint of orange to kind of match it to the horse. All right, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same exact thing to the reds. So let's isolate that jacket, that second part of the jacket right there. That's perfect. So everything but her lipstick is fine. So just that part of the red go back here, change the saturation level, tone that down, maybe make it, yeah, right there, just pull out a lot of that saturation. Uh, let's see, what can you, maybe add it, maybe add just a, a hint of fuchsia to it, maybe make it just a tinge purple, you guys know I love purple. Um, and let's do it one more time for the blue in the pants. So let's grab the blues here. And by no means is this a Photoshop tutorial, but if you learn something, good for you. Anyway, yeah, that's the blues. So let's just pull out. I'm just, yeah, I'm just gonna pull out the blues, make them basically gray. There we go. There we go. So I did absolutely nothing to this project except reevaluate the colors that I would have chosen for her vest, her shirt underneath, and her blue pants. Instead of making them like over-the-top uh, vibrant and perhaps the reference photo was a little over-the-top vibrant instead I just I just it was at a 10 I put it at like a 2 so it was like way over the top and all I did was yank out some of that saturation and maybe retone it just a, t a, a tad to make it fit into the scene more naturally you still have the same colors but you just you just yank out some of the saturation so that it makes sense. Um, and then what you could end up doing is with the colors that you, you know, you wanted to be in there vibrantly or whatnot. So let's just grab, I'm trying to find a yellow here. And make it nice and bright, maybe, maybe here-ish, something like that. Let's see, what, yeah, that's good. Um, since you have low saturation in your scene, what you can do after the fact is you can, you can start adding back in some saturation. So maybe in this particular scene, um, maybe it's like early morning, you know, you have the, the golden hour of the sun coming through and so you want a little bit of the light 
So you want to add some of the yellow of the sun back in. So you want some vibrancy. So you grab your yellow, you grab your bright yellow, and you add a nice rim light around your subject. Maybe add some yellow here, bring in some yellow uh, on your subject here, brighten up the highlights in the hair, something along those lines. Um, just give the, the horse a nice rim light around the edges. Touch of yellow, splash of yellow. Uh, so a little bit of saturation in there. And that's just going to make your subject fit into a scene cohesively now that the colors are rebalanced and nothing is too far extreme. Once you remove the extreme, then you can reintroduce a new extreme. And in this case, I just chose a yellow to kind of give it, to just kind of give it a, um, you know, a morning like sunrise type feel. Uh, and I think that's gonna add a lot to your work. So here is the before where the colors didn't quite cohesively fit together and then rebalancing the colors and just adding a splash of new color, uh, we have something like this. And so I think that uh, would improve your work quite a bit. Just be careful with your color saturation. Uh, and good job, by the way, on the picture. All right, let's move on. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I really need water after this. And also a, a break from talking. All right, uh, this one here. So let's see, who did this one? Did I mention who did the last one? Uh, if I didn't, it was Susie. Good job, by the way, Susie. Um, by the way, it was Prismacolor and some other color pencil I never heard of on drafting film. All right, this one is Patricia. Uh, pan pastels on pastel man. No way. This is pan pastels? Oh, I thought it was watercolor. <laughs> Anybody else think this was watercolor? I didn't think this was pan pastels. I wouldn't have guessed that in a million years. Um, anyways, uh, first thing, I really like the colors in this one. I, I yeah, the, these colors are really great. Really great colors. Um, good composition too. I like the composition. Um, and I think that, I mean, the scene is really nice. Yeah, the scene is really nice, the colors are really nice, composition is really nice. Now, let's talk about where you might be able to improve. Now, one of the things that um, kind of stands out to me, first off, is the amount of depth that you create in an image. Anytime you're dealing with landscapes, now, the, the general rule for landscapes outside of, you know, the basics like perspective and stuff like that is creating depth. And a lot of times people ask, like, how do you create depth in uh, landscapes? And there's a few different ways of, of doing it. Uh, the first is, of course, creating layers of different subject matter. So you have the foreground, you have the middle ground, and then you have the background. In your case, uh, your your sky I, looks a touch of blue in the sky or something like that. But you have a few different uh, wrong opacity. You have a few different layers, a few different clear layers here. So you have the trees. That's obviously your background back back section. You have a middle ground section, which is your little river creek thingy here. And then you have, of course, the foreground subject matter, which is, of course, the two kids sitting on the stone. And when you want to create depth in your landscapes, as objects, so there's two ways to say it. You can say as objects get further or as objects get closer. Let's start with the background because any times I do, I, I do a landscape, I always start with the furthest objects first because it's just easier to lay things on top of that. So in the, in the furthest back that your landscape goes, you want to use muted colors and low saturation. So in this case, the saturation and values that you have in your background are very similar, if not the same, as your foreground. And that eliminates a lot of the depth potential that you could otherwise create. So the rule is, as you get closer 
to your foreground subject subject the value of the value of the colors that you use increases which means your darks get darker and your lights get lighter and the saturation increases so in the in the background I'm actually just going to create a quick copy of this really quick so in your background let's just lighten the background just a tad and that's going to pull out some of the saturation and also the values make it a little bit muted hello wifey did you see i put cardboard in the thing just the pantry anyways so i'm going to lighten it and i'm going to pull out some of the saturation of the background um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to mask everything and I'm going to I'm going to fade out your background. So just pull out some of the saturation, pull out some of the values of the background there. Just make it lighter overall. And I only did it subtly. I didn't want to do it extreme because you don't you don't ever want anything extreme. So that's, that's one thing. Um, and so here's the difference. So here's full saturation, full value. That matches the foreground. And here's just fading it a little bit. You can start to see, you can start to see that your eyes are being pulled more towards your main subjects because your main subjects, a lot like the eye in a portrait, have the most value and saturation. Just like we saw in that previous portrait where I added a little bit of value and saturation to the guy's iris, all of a sudden you could only stare at the eye. So here's one subtle thing. Use more muted tones in the background. Um, the second part is the water. So let's just copy this. Uh, let's put it here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mask this. There we go. Um, so with, with the water, what I think uh, you're having here, not necessarily the color saturation and values in the water competing with the foreground as it is the texture. Now, uh, like I said earlier, another, um, another type of contrast is textural contrast. And, you know, water generally has a lot of texture. You have all the ripples and waves and things like that in water. But in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove it. So let's go to motion blur. Where's motion blur? Yeah. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to motion blur the water. Oh, this is the wrong layer, sorry. I'm gonna motion blur the water. So this is as if I blended out the pastel, since I know it's pastel now. Uh, horizontally in the direction that the water is going. Blur, blur, hello, motion blur. All right, maybe not that much. Maybe, I wanna leave a little bit of texture in there, right? Don't wanna go too extreme. Let's just try to blend it in the way that the water is going, so something like that, perhaps. There we go. And then invert. And I just want the water. So I'm just going to blur the water. And one of the things that you have here is you have a little bit of haloing around your main subjects. You can fix that by uh, using masking film or just uh, being very, very careful and perhaps like working really slow around that area. Uh, so that might be a bit extreme. So let me just tone that, that blur down just a tad, just a tad, maybe, maybe just there. There we go. So those are two things that I think you can do to improve your picture here. Uh, you could also go a little bit more vibrant in uh, your main subjects, but aside from that, just trying to create a little bit more depth there. So here is the before. Um, still a really great uh, pastel painting, but to create a little bit more depth, 
tone down the values and contrast in the background. And then also um, you want to tone down the textural contrast. So um, again, the, uh, the background, you want to have low contrast, low saturation, low texture. So it's low in all of those things. As you come closer to your main subjects and your foreground, the value increases, the saturation increases, and the textural contrast increases. So here is, uh, oops, that's the wrong, there. That is the small adjustments that you can make to just make it feel a little bit more deeper. You can see the foreground, you can feel the foreground being closer to you at that point. Anyways, fantastic job, Patricia. All right, on to Matthew. I think uh, most of the family knows Matthew, see his work all the time, uh, and it is fantastic. And of course, he submits uh, a masterpiece like this and expects me to critique it, but he mentioned a few things. So uh, he, he said this is his first real attempt at hyperrealism. Uh, using Copic markers, polychromos, pencils, Strathmore toned paper. Uh, not sure if he wants to add a background. All right, so um, first off, it's it's a really fantastic picture. Uh, contrast wise, you you nailed it on the head. Uh, you're you're definitely one of the few that is not afraid to go dark in skin tones. Uh, honestly, your skin tones here are just spot on fantastic. They, they just have so much color, just very, very great uh, color range in the skin. Uh, you can see the texture that you've added to the skin. And even though I wouldn't go as far as saying hyper-realism with the texture, uh, it is still like like pinnacle realism. Um, the, the thing that you'll have to do to, to, to reach that hyper-realism level is you're gonna have to draw bigger. Um, this looks like it's maybe on like a five paper size, somewhere around there. Um, it, this doesn't look like a four, I could be wrong. And if, if I am wrong, let me know. You can just, you know, say it on Facebook or whatever. But it, it, seems, it seems relatively small um, I would say his face is probably about the size of my hand. And if I'm wrong about that, you know, feel free to let me know. But based on the detail that you've been able to accomplish, that's what I'm, that's what I'm placing. I'm placing the, the head is about the size of my hand. And if you're going to do a hyper-realism portrait, there is no way you can do it with a, with a face the size of your hand. The reason, the reason that that is and you can uh, take this uh, so that you know if you want to if you want to try hyperrealism or photorealism, whichever you prefer to call it, um, you're gonna have to go bigger. Just I, 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 anything that has hair, um, in order to get the hyper slash photorealism, uh, you need to be able to draw hairs, and the thickness of a colored pencil is too thick to draw a hair when the head is only the size of your hand. So keep that in mind. Um, aside from that, I mean, there's very, very little that I can really critique here. Um, I would say I am familiar with the reference photo since uh, I watched the, the Breaking Bad series. Um, the uh, scars on the forehead here, uh, they seem just a bit thick, seem a little bit thick and a just something about them, uh, particularly this one here, just is a tiny bit off. It, it might be that you just overemphasized it a hint and it's kind of sticking out um, a bit too much. Um, this one, not so much. This one's not, this one's more natural looking, but this one here, you just did maybe a, a touch, just a touch, um, too, too deep, too deep. Um, and remember, when when you're doing when you're doing realism, hyperrealism, photorealism, whatever you want to call it, um, subtlety is always going to be uh, the key to 
to that precision. So I just want to be careful with that. Um, great, great work on the eyes, uh, the highlights. Uh, again, this is another reason why I think the, the drawing is a bit small, uh, is because the, the detail in the eye it could also be that you, you said you couldn't figure out how to upload the high resolution picture. So maybe that's why the, the, um, the drawing uh, feels like it's smaller than it is from my perspective. Um, sorry, I keep zooming in and out on accident. <clears throat> but the detail in the eye, it also seems like uh, it's, it's hard to get it precise simply because the drawing is small. Uh, the other thing is the jacket. I don't can't remember if this is a leather jacket or not that he's wearing. Um, but I can see the pencil direction lines, which is um, kind of giving it away a little bit that it's a drawing. So you might want to um, the the whatever approach you went for this this part of the jacket here, it looks like a colored pencil drawing, which um, based on it wanting to be hyper realism you have to eliminate that you have to find you have to find the subtle texture of the jacket and you have to move your pencil in that direction to eliminate that feeling or that visual uh, cue that this is indeed a drawing uh, the other part is also the beard um, the beard feels heavy and what i mean by that is you know anytime you have facial hair and and he, he had he has pretty thick facial hair in this reference photo from what I remember because, you know, this, this reference photo was used like a million and a half times uh, and I've seen it, I've seen it a lot, very, very popular uh, reference. And um, the, even though the beard is thick, it's, you'll still be able to see through it a little bit. And your beard here is very heavy and what i mean by that is there is no there's no visual cues that i can see in your drawing that that suggest there's there's even skin underneath which i don't think happens in the reference photo i'd have to look at the reference photo but um it just feels it just feels a little heavy where um so i, I think that that's another cue that tells me um this drawing's not big enough for hyperrealism. To do a full-scale portrait hyperrealism, uh, the face needs to be at least by like, it needs to be at least A4. The the head needs to be A4. Like that that is going to give you like just enough space to really get the hyperrealism, um, because again you can't draw hairs at their realistic thickness if you draw too small using pencils. Um, but anyways. I am, uh, I'm going to move on from this one because it's so good that I can't really say much about it. N anything negative anyway. Fantastic job, Matthew. I love seeing your work, by the way. All right. The next one here, this is, this is Amy's. Um, this is based on a picture that she took on holiday, uh, pastel matte paper, uh, using the Carbothalo pastel pencils and some soft pastel sticks. Um, this is this is really great. Um, fun subject, and you did a really, really good job of getting that 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 subtle texture, those those key texture spots on the feathers to make them look like they're fluffy and feather-like. Um, I mentioned this uh, on the first project with the sharpness of lines. Um, we had that we had that horse horse picture, this one here, that I, that I mentioned, uh, just cleaning up the lines a little bit. And I think the same holds true on this one here. Um, the, the tree branch, I think if you, if you were able to make it just a little bit crispier on that edge, just cleaner edges on the, on the tree branch, you're really gonna start to see the tree branch stick out more from the background, which I think is gonna add to the project. Um, oh, absolutely, Matthew. I'm glad you're able to catch it live, too. Um, but anyways, yeah, just sharpening the edges of the tree branch there is gonna help, help make it stick out. And then also, again, with the backgrounds. So I'm gonna do something really quick here with the background. 
Um, the background, as far as the texture goes, is spot on. It really looks like a blurry background. But what I think you need to also be cautious of with backgrounds, when you have a really kind of bright main subject, you want to be careful not to overdo the saturation of the background. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to tone down the background and then bring out the brightness of the bird. So here's the original. You can kind of see the high saturation levels of the yellow green in the background. If you if it's just toned down just a tiny bit, I think it still I, th I think it still brings in a lot of the life that, that you had in the background, but it brings more attention to the bird. And that is that other type of, that is that saturation contrast that I was mentioning before, where you don't have the saturation levels competing with, the, with one another. Um, and um, I think artistically, you still get the effect of the background um, without, uh, without diminishing the, the focal point of the image. Um, and I have the reference photo here and the reference photo is pretty much the same thing. Like you have, you have the, uh, the, the saturation of the background and the bird pretty much flat even in the reference photo. And so when you, when you have a reference photo that, you know, that has that, when you're replicating it, you know, use your artistic license to make the changes that you, that you think will benefit the work in the end. And, and in this case, I think what will benefit it is to not have the background saturation competing so much with the main subject. Um, but other than that, very fantastic. Very great picture. All right, now another, what I believe is a pastel painting. Uh, this is from Beth. She didn't give me any other information about it, but I, I think it's pastel. It looks, it looks very pastel-like. Really great subject. Um, fantastic colors. Yeah, you have, you have really good colors here. Uh, I love the subtle purple coming up at the top here. So really great. Um, I'm going to just touch on, I have like 10 more that I need to do. So I'm going to try to breeze through these last few without doing anything too extreme. Um, yeah, great colors. Everything about it is really, really good. Uh, the values are good. I think what you could have done is boost the values a little bit in the uh, subject here. He has like that reddish brown color, which makes the light look like it's shining on him. You could have probably went a little bit darker in some of the areas and created more of like a rim light kind of thing. So I'm just going to do this really quick because otherwise I'm... Yeah, so if I just went like, if you just go a little bit darker on the subject here, on the back side, the back edge of him, he'll stand out a little bit more. My, my brush is, is very soft, so it, it doesn't quite work. But um, you can see just, just a little bit more value in there in the subject, and he's gonna stand out even more against the background. Um, the other thing is texture. You have all this texture back here. If you, if you blurred that, maybe I can just use the blur tool. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. Never mind. Um, if if you if you blend out the water in the back, this is going to bring more attention to the front, um, and then also make sure your lines um, don't change. So don't change your lines here. The the line direction um, brush, yes. So the line direction here. You have lines that are nice horizontal, which makes sense. Um, and then they start to slant more and more. And you gotta be careful with that because the light would not, the, the light would not do that. If the water is on a slant, it's gonna shorten the highlight. If it's flat, you're gonna get, you're gonna get a longer highlight because the light is gonna be hitting that, what's reflecting into your eye more. But as you tilt that, the highlight shrinks so um, the highlight would not change direction like that light light does not work like that so be careful with your lines you want them to be you want them to be uh, 
the same. You want them to be parallel all the time because light does not curve like that. Uh, but yeah, um, other than that, uh, really great. Make sure, you know, objects that are perfectly round, when they're not perfectly round, people pick up on that. Make sure your sun is perfectly round. It's a little, it's just a, a tinge wonky, so keep that in mind. All right, moving on to the next one. Uh, this one here, Lovely Tiger, by, where's it at? This one is by Debbie. Uh, this is Pastel Pencils. Uh, still a little heavy-handed when laying down the first layer. Um, and not quite done with the background, so somewhat of a work in progress, but still really good. Um, the colors, I, th I think the white's perfectly fine here. The colored paper is really good. Everything about it's really nice. Um, remember, 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 always move in the direction that the fur is going. That's really, really important. Also, don't forget, like if you're gonna leave, if you're gonna leave texture in the, gr in the fur, you're not gonna like smooth it out and make it real soft and stuff. Um, don't, don't forget the texture that's on, this, on the, the nose here. Of, of any cat or dog that has short hair. Um, you want to use dots. So you want to add texture here to, by doing stippling with your pencils. That's gonna help bring that texture out. Uh, and then the other thing, to increase the, uh, uh, the focus of the eyes, add the darker values near the top. So you have some here. You have some some nice darker values. I'm going to um, just do this. So I'm going to add a little bit darker at the tops of the eyes to make them appear more three-dimensional. So a little bit more. Your eyes just look a tiny bit flatter than what I think you'd want them to look. So there, boom. So flat eyes and then eyes that pull you in and eat you alive, right? Flat eyes, eyes that make you want to stare at them. Um, but uh, yeah, not a whole lot to say about this one. It's really great. I love the paper color that you chose, by the way. It's, it's good paper color. Um, and yeah, have fun finishing it. Keep up the good work. All right, this is another work in progress, another horse subject. And this one is by Joy. Oh, Joy. Um, yes, you can submit a work in progress. Uh, this one's coming out really, really nice. Um, as far as I can tell from the reference photo, your accuracy is really, really good. Um, you know, just keep following the, the, the first axiom of doing anything fur hair related, always move in the direction, which it looks like you're doing a really good job. Um, I can see the subtle blues that you've added to this horse that feels a little bit more complete. Don't be afraid to, to sprinkle in a little bit of other colors too, maybe some browns. You could go. You could go with some yellows if you want to bring in some sunlight. You can. You can go all kinds of crazy with your black fur. Um, black fur, black hair is one of my favorites to draw and paint and color because you can. You can start with just the the foundation of the blacks and grays that make up all the values that you see in the hair, and then you can pick literally any color from from the the rainbow to tone your fur with, and you're going to get a different feel every single time. So in this case, you chose you know a nice natural blue, and the blue makes sense because your horses uh, that you have a reference photo of are outside, and the sky looks relatively blue, a little bit cloudy maybe. And so that blue is coming from the reflection of the sky onto the horse. So contextually, it makes a lot of sense that you're using blue. Um, but when you're outside, you know, the sun is also nice and yellow, so you can add some browns into it and bring in a little, a little hint of yellow to add some, some sunlight to your horses as well, to, just to brighten them up. Uh, another thing is with the eyes. Uh, it looks like your eyes are just kind of flat black. If you take a brown, if you take a, like a nice deep hazel brown and you apply it to the underside of the eye, so down here, so nice, nice hazel brown. What you're, what you're gonna get is you're going to actually get deeper eyes. But the irony is that the, you're, you're lightening the eyes, but it's getting, 
it's getting uh, deeper. And so you want to add a subtle variation to the color of the eyes. You can also use a nice bright blue to tone the top edge of the eyes. Uh, you could go with green on the bottom as, you know, green from the grass, maybe not that green. But um, yeah, you get the idea. You know, touch a green, touch a brown on the bottom. Just, you can see that eye now. So here's without, that's just flat black, maybe a bit of gray. And here's with a, a hint of blue on the top, hit of brown and green on the bottom, reflecting the ground and reflecting the sky. So consider that, that's gonna help make your eyes look really deep and um, interesting. All right, next one. I got like five more to do. I'm gonna try to bust these out real quick. All right, this one, um, really great subject, super cute. This one is by, I really should have organized this better, but um, this is Mia. Um, this I think is pastel. I believe this is pastel. To me, it looks pastel-like. So I'm gonna go on that assumption that it's pastel. Um, first thing, uh, if you wanna separate your subject from the background, I highly recommend masking film. I use it myself for many, many reasons. And one of the reasons is that I never have to worry about working around my main subject. As everyone can clearly see you have done here by the halo effect around your main subject. Um, you know, just cutting out the general shape and then, you know, working, peeling it off after you finish the background just makes everything a thousand times easier. Now, based on the reference photo, uh, you change the colors in the background just a, just a tad. Uh, again, with the background being too vibrant, you want to tone down that saturation and bring more attention to your main subject. The other thing that you want to do with the background is definitely fade uh, the texture out. So I'm going to just duplicate this really quick. I am going to blur the background. Blur, oops, that is the wrong blur. I'm gonna do that. Blur, Gaussian blur. So let's just, let's just get rid of all the texture in the background. Just, just super smooth, as smooth as uh, I think is humanly possible. I'm also going to pull out some of the saturation, just to, just a touch of the saturation, maybe tone down the green maybe bring in a little bit more orange. I think that's, yeah, a little bit more orange. Tone down the saturation and I think that's good. Let's just go ahead and mask that off really quick. And then let's bring back this cute little kitty. So just gonna bring back the cat. So again, for the background, I really, really tried to remove all of the texture. I also toned down the saturation a little bit and I altered the color because the, the greenish neon, like lime green, isn't quite represented in nature. So you wanna pull that back and add some orange to it. Uh, the reason you add orange is because um, orange is made by yellow plus red, and red is the complement to green, and the way to tone down any color is to apply the complement. So, to tone it down a, a touch, you add the in-between color, like orange. Um, but yeah, so I think that adds, I think that, I think that helps the, the cat stand out in the background feel a little less distracting. Now I realize there is a tree right behind the cat, and you can decide whether or not you want to add those branches back in, or if you want to try to focus on like a log or whatever that it's sitting on. The choice is totally yours. Either way, um, good good work on the um, composition here. Great rule of thirds. The, the cat's head is basically the upper left third, which is really good. So here's the before. Uh, you know, the background's really bright. It's, it's still got a lot of texture in it. And if you just tone down the color of the background and blur it out even more, you get something that looks closer to this. Uh, fan fantastic job, Mia. All right, up next, oh, another portrait. Okay, this one, uh, I'm not gonna touch my mouse on, I'm just gonna talk about. Um, so uh, you mentioned, oh wait, let me also mention who did this one. Uh, I remember you talking about this uh, in the live stream, uh, Sherry. So this was the, the blonde hair question that I got last week or some time ago, I don't remember when exactly. Uh, difficulty doing blonde hair. 
and I'll, I'll touch on a, touch on it a little bit of how to do blonde hair as I talk about this. So the uh, uh, great subject, remember, remember, remember when you're doing a portrait, always focus on the precision of the facial features. That is most important. Um, from my quick glance here, you're pretty close with the eyes. Um, careful with the eyebrows, they're a little small in your drawing, just a, just a tiny bit too small, um, a bit narrow. They look almost too perfect. Uh, you don't want to ever have too perfect of eyebrows because then they, then they look like they're, you know, drawn on. Um, so careful with that. Uh, the other thing is your value range. So this is definitely a, a color fear um, coming in to play a little bit. So definitely look at the shadow that's occurring right below the eyebrow, around the eye, and also underneath the chin. So that shadow is very dark. Um, since this is not the exact reference photo, uh, and I'm pulling from a photo of a photo, uh, I won't be able to get the colors perfectly, but lately, let's just measure the values based on the photograph here. So this is the color beneath the eye and the, the neck. Same color, it's the same color. There's not a lot of color variation here in her skin. And now let's look at the value difference. We're just the, the value difference between these two colors. This color is significantly darker than the color that you have beneath the neck, which is the darkest part of the face, by the way, um, with the exception of the corner of the lips. Um, and the eyebrows. But this color here uh, is happening underneath the, the jaw and um, underneath the eyebrow. And that is that, that creates a lot of the form and the structure of the face. And without that, your face looks very two-dimensional. So you have to go darker with your colors. It's very key. And the same thing with the mouth. Um, the shape of the mouth not not quite there. You didn't quite get the shape of the mouth um, exactly. And then also the chin. So um, in your drawing, painting, I think it's pastels, right? Did you mention it was pastels? Mm, no. Yeah, I think it's pastels. It looks pastel-like. Um, the, uh, the chin on your pastel painting is much more rounded, whereas if you look at her chin, her chin has a nice curve. So her cheek comes, her cheek is very puffy, like most young children, puffy cheek. And then you'll notice the, the opposite direction, this convex, this convex curve right there at her chin, right there. Yours has it a little bit, but it's too high. It's too close to the corner of her mouth up here. Um, and since the accuracy of the mouth is off a, a little bit, uh, your mouth is drawn um, a bit, a bit too narrow, a bit too the corners of the mouth too close together. So her mouth is quite a bit smaller in your uh, your painting there. So just work on the accuracy, work on adding the darker values to the skin, and then also let's talk about blonde hair. So um, blonde hair is usually harder to color because we always associate blonde hair with the color yellow and yellow, um, although it can be a toning color in like platinum blonde color of hair, uh, mostly what you're gonna get from blonde hair are just dirty browns. And I usually refer to it as like dirty dishwater um, because you're gonna get colors like this, you're gonna get colors like this, you're gonna get colors like this, and the highlight color like this. Where's the yellow? Um, I don't see any yellow. And the reason, uh, the reason we associate blonde hair with yellow is because the hair is completely made up of these very murky gray colors. And then, and then you get your yellow. Wherever, uh, context-wise, as far as like the sun or something like that, uh, you get your yellow from the tone so you'll have these, these, uh, you'll have these murky colors, and then you're going to have yellow coming over top of them, toning the hair, and that usually happens on either sides of highlights. 
So you'll have the bright highlight, and then where the highlight fades into the midtone color, uh, you'll have the, uh, the, the hint of yellow, like the golden yellow, the orange yellow, depending on what shade of blonde hair it is. So that's where the yellow comes from. Um, whereas you took this color, which is the murky color plus the yellow, and you used that as your base color, and that's why your hair looks too yellow. <clears throat> so you need, to, you need to pull back the yellow, reverse on the yellow, go think less gold and more mud. Um, and that's blonde hair in a nutshell. All right, I will do a blonde hair tutorial eventually. Eventually, again, I've done a blonde hair tutorial, but I'll do another one. Um, anyways, uh, Peter, I, th I believe, am I remembering correctly? I, Peter is the the reason for this live stream. Yes, Peter, this is your cat, Willow, your granddaughter's cat, Willow. Okay. All right. Um, oh goodness, pet portraits, so many. Um, uh, okay, so Carbothello pencils on pastel matte. Okay, I appreciate the uh, the extra info there, Peter. Because um, I actually, I, th I totally thought this was colored pencil. Um, so a few things working. You, you have really great contrast in your image. The eyes really, really stand out. Um, and that is, that, that you definitely want to keep there. You, you definitely want to, to maintain that level of contrast and that level of contrast particularly in the eyes because when I look at this, I look at the eyes. Like that's, that's, that's where I look when I look at this, uh, this pastel painting here. I'm looking at the eyes and that's where you want to look and where you want the viewer to look when you're doing portraits 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, one of the things where I think you can improve is you can improve on the texture of the fur. Now, I don't have the reference photo in front of me, although uh, I've seen enough cats to know that, you know, they have fur, and with fur comes lines. And I can see a little bit of the lines down here at the bottom. I'm just gonna zoom in, Ted. I can see a little bit of the directional lines down here. But it doesn't, it doesn't appear uh, as a general pattern throughout the cat, these these textural lines. And so you want to, the, the first axiom, actually it's like the first and only axiom that I have when it comes to hair and fur, and that is to always, always, always color or paint in that direction that the fur is going. And with the cat's nose, so um, let me back up. I, um, there's, well, when it comes to human portraits, you have to get the eyes in the right place, you have to get the nose in the right place, you have to get the mouth in the right place. Those key features are so critical for uh, capturing um, similarity or capturing the, um, the word is escaping my head right now, the, recogniz the recognizability of that person. And when it comes to pet portraits, you have a shortcut. You only have the eyes and the nose that you really need to worry about. So precision of eyes, precision of nose placement, absolutely critical for the recognizability of the pet. So make sure that when you're doing your line art, you, you hone in on those, those three things, you know, each eye and then the nose, um, and you get them exactly the way they are. The fur, believe it or not, is actually kind of second nature. It's not actually the key feature that makes the animal recognizable. It's always the eyes. So um, focus, focus more time on what is happening around the eyes as well, because cats, their eyes don't go straight from eyeball straight into the fur. There's a little, there's a little gap there for some skin. Usually it's like a darker tone, like a black or maybe like a dark, dark peach or brown color, something along those lines. Uh, so make sure you add a little bit of a transitionary space where it goes eye, eyelid, skin, and then it transitions into the fur. So there's gonna be a little bit of extra detail that I think you need to focus on right around the eyes. The other thing, um, 
the other thing is the the tops of the nose, the snout or whatever you want to call it. Um, the fur is very, very short there, but there is fur. And usually, uh, I talked about this on the tiger project, you want to add little dots there to create that sensation of fur. Um, that's going to help you, you know, just harmonize the texture of fur over the entire animal. You don't want to have the fur texture everywhere except here. Um, so to create that, that short fur texture, add dots. Um, the other thing that you can do is, uh, you know, ears have whiskers too. Ears have those individual hairs that kind of stick out a little bit and they're usually lighter and they kind of look like whiskers. So um, if you had a few of those in the ears, I think that level of detail would, would help uh, just, you know, make the cat's whole head and face just appear more, more uh, in, in focus. And sometimes they even come out of the eyebrows a little bit, extra long, like white, lighter hairs. So just, you know, have a look at your reference photo and see if those, those details pop out to you. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, the other thing that you can do that I think will add a lot to this picture is consider doing a drop shadow. And so I'm just going to literally take an oval here. Let's just do, let's see here, let me transform this. So I'm just going to take a little oval, maybe, maybe like, maybe like this. I am going to fill this up with black. I'm going to blur it and just give it some soft edges here. And I'm going to shrink it down just a little bit more. Maybe something like this. And then I'm going to change it to multiply and change the opacity. So um, consider adding a drop shadow. That way your little cat here feels like it feels like it has actual volume. What is going on? Oh, my opacity is too low. That's what it is. Yeah. So this this will help give the sensation that the cat actually has a volume and is three dimensional. And it doesn't take a lot to add a drop shadow. And you can make it various shapes. You don't have to make it a circle. I just did a circle to show you what it would look like. But if you add that drop shadow, it's just going to make the cat feel like it's feel like it's a bit more three dimensional. So consider that. Um, and you can use various colors to do the drop shadow. You don't have to use black. You can you can use like a varying shade of gray and then maybe add a little bit of blue to it, a little bit of blue, uh, uh, brown, whatever colors you think fits. What I recommend is whatever colors you're using in the cat itself, use that as the drop shadow. Don't add additional colors. Reuse the colors. That will create color harmony throughout the project. Anyways, uh, good job, Peter. Um, moving on. Uh, this one here, so I have two more. I have this one and then one after it. This one is by Shell. Um, this one is done in pastels. And there is a reference photo to this, and I want to just do a quick comparison of the reference photo. First thing, um, you change the colors of the bird, which I like. I think the pink is really great. But what you, um, I don't know if, you, if you're calling this one finished or not yet, but what, uh, what the original reference photo has is the more orange color for the, the chest feathers, but you'll notice that there is a there is a degree of varying values in that in those feathers. And so um, what's keeping this from looking three-dimensional is essentially those those key uh, changes in value. So I'm just gonna grab a different value here. And I'm just gonna make this bird just appear a little bit more three-dimensional by darkening one side. And this is gonna give it more of a rounded shape like that. And so just by doing, just by changing a little bit of the values, maybe grab a highlight color here and give it, you know, a sprinkle of, of white there. Um, just by adding a 
bit more value to that, the bird is looking more three-dimensional. So definitely consider that. Otherwise, it looks like um, it looks like it's very accurately drawn. So, I mean, aside from just you know reevaluating your value changes to make it more three-dimensional, um, you're you're good to go. Also, the beak appears to just be um, shades of gray. Don't be afraid to add a little bit of blue into the beak because that beak is reflecting the sunlight since it is a smooth object. Same thing with the back feathers here. These black, uh, these back feathers um, being of light value, they are reflecting the sky as well as the top of the head. So consider adding some blue into the feathers to represent the reflection of the surrounding light since this bird is indeed outdoors. So yeah, good job. Moving on to the uh, the final project. This is also a work in progress, and I believe this is one of the last ones that I had submitted. Uh, Kyan, I see your digital painting of Young Blood. Um, I'm not going to do a. I'm not going to bring it into Photoshop right now, but um, what I would recommend uh, in Kyan, I, I, if you're watching this or if you see this, you'll hear what I'm saying. Um, try to bring in some different values on the skin. Um, and the skin is looking a little yellow, so bring in some oranges, bring in some reds, and also don't forget about purple. Um, but keep up the good work. Anyways, this portrait here is from Anne. And let's see, pastel pencil on pastel mat. Okay, okay, okay. Um, Okay, so this is um, the, this project. She wants the look to be partially incomplete, is what I'm gathering from her comment here. Um, so when anytime you do work where you want it to look incomplete in some areas where it kind of just fades into the paper, which I think is a very cool look, you have to compensate in the areas of focus. So in this case, it's a portrait, so you really want to focus on the eyes. So the the reference photo, um, the reference photo is not well lit. It's very flat. It's very flatly lit, and there's no sparkle in the eyes. So you want to consider making some alterations to the eyes in particular, since that is the focal point. That's where you want. That's you know I keep saying it over and over again. Like that's where people are looking. So if you just take a little bit of, of color, a little bit of white, a little bit of gray, and maybe just give it, give the eye, again with the opacity level, um, give the eye a little bit of sparkle somewhere. It doesn't, it doesn't really even matter where you give it, but give it something. And then also with your black in the pupils, make sure you give the pupils a nice deep look uh, same thing with the eyelashes. Don't be afraid to give the eyelashes a nice one or two over with some black. Um, you know, you can you could possibly consider giving her a little bit of makeup. Uh, the orange paper, you could play off of the orange paper and maybe give her some, you have some nice orange tones happening here under the eye. Maybe you can enhance the orange. Um, and go with like some bluish eyeshadow. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just play here for the last project. So I'm gonna take some blue. I'm just gonna give her that is way overpowered. Let me go back here on the opacity. So I'm just gonna give her a little bit of just a touch of blue eyeshadow. I'm not gonna go extreme. I don't want to make her look like a clown. Um, just a touch of blue eyeshadow, and bam, her eyes pop like crazy, right? So no makeup touch of blue eyeshadow. I get it in the reference photo, she's not wearing eyeshadow, but blue is the complement to orange. So why not play a little bit, maybe give her a little bit of blue sh blue eyeshadow there. Um, if you don't give her blue eyeshadow, you can you can tone her, um, her highlights and her scleras blue. Um, you can use blue as a highlight also. So if I go a little bit more saturated and just a tad bit brighter with the blue, I can I can add some blue highlights, like she's staring out the window. So on her cheeks, blue highlights, 
play off of the complements. Use the color of the paper to your advantage. So now, how much more interesting does the face look? Like, there's a lot of, there's a lot more color happening there. And it was just, you know, it's just a hint of blue. You don't have to go crazy with it, but just think about what you have um, and make all the considerations possible. So um, anyways, uh, that is going to be it. Um, yes, uh, Cryan, did you, did you hear my critique of, of yours? I gave, uh, I gave you some feedback like maybe five minutes ago. Um, I'm not gonna, I can't pull it into my Photoshop uh, because I was already live streaming when you posted it. Um, anyways, uh, that is going to be it. Um, so I hope that this was helpful. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, I'll, I'll probably do another one, I don't know, in a few months time, give you guys some time to turn out some, some good work. And uh, yeah, I, I hope it was helpful for the, those of you that submitted and for those of you that, that didn't get a chance to submit. This won't be the last time that, did, that I, I do a critique like this. So, you know, no worries there. I'll do it again sometime. But uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, that is going to be it for today. Um, and I will see you, well, if you follow me over on Patreon, I'll see you next Tuesday. Um, but other than that, have a fantastic rest of your Monday. Peace.